Hello, welcome to the GST podcast. We dive into the minds of athletes, coaches, and people in fitness and sport, scratching beneath the surface to see what makes them tick, but also what lessons and strategies they can pass on to you, our listeners from their own journey. This week we are joined by 22-year-old British CrossFit and GST athlete Ella Wilkinson. She qualified for semi-finals this year for the first time, but this isn't the first time she's been knocking on the door of elite levels of performance. We dig a little deeper again in this one today. I hope you enjoy. If you could do me a quick favour, if you could like, subscribe, follow, wherever you're listening to this podcast, we would really appreciate it because it helps us more than you know. Cheers. We're back. We are back. We're back in business. <laughs> this week, we are joined by Stephen Fawcett. Hello. And Ella Wilkinson. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Ella's just recently qualified for semi-finals for the first time. Congratulations, Ella. Thank you. <laughs> um, we're going to dive a little bit deeper this week. Uh, we've done like we did with David and Phil Roy. Mm-hmm. Um, not many people probably know too much about Yella. You've not done any podcast before. This yeah. is a podcast virginity that we're taking. <laughs> um, so I guess let's give people a just a rough idea who you are, kind of where you're from. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm 22 years old. I've been doing CrossFit since I'd finished my GCSEs, so like 16 years, so quite a while. Um, I'm originally from the Wirral, but currently living in Wigan. <laughs> um, come from a gymnastics background, mm-hmm. sort of different disciplines since probably like the age of nine. And yeah, I've been hooked to CrossFit ever since, really. I'd like to know a bit more because I, I know a bit. I know obviously like you did tumbling and and there's like trampolining. Yeah. But more about like when you were doing tra- gymnastics and all the different disciplines. Like what like what was it that you were doing? And then from that we'll probably just naturally go into like how how have you found what you did from nine years old to like how, how does it help you yeah. like now as a crossfit? So what like. What in gymnastics, the different disciplines, was it that you did? So from the age of like 9 to 13, I was a tumbler. So for people that don't know what that is, it's quite hard to describe. So you've got like a 25-meter track, yeah. and you've got a little bit of a run-up, and you'd basically hoe yourself down the track. <laughs> I think you had like, it's been that long, I can't even remember. You had like, I think you did seven moves on the track. So whether it's like flicks, whips, full twisting whips, all these crazy movements and then you'd end with like a big sort of like big finish, big, finish, yeah. big move at the end land on a mat yeah. hopefully on your feet when, um, when I was doing a little bit of just research about your background and stuff yeah. I did see some videos of you doing your your yeah. cartwheel flips yeah. springs it, it, like you say it's when you look at the Olympics and they're running down and they do start doing all the cartwheels yeah. flips yeah. It, it, it is crazy impressive the power um, that you have to do that it's yeah. Yeah, I think when you're younger as well, like the mental side of it, you just see it as like fun. Yeah, so you don't even yeah, think yeah. like, if, especially if you've got, I've got, I consider I've got ADHD. But like, <laughs> I didn't care. I just, I just do it. I had all this energy that I wanted to waste. So yeah, I loved it. And then I remember I met a friend in high school who was a trampolinist, mm-hmm. and she kind of encouraged me to come along. And when you, because when you tumble, you think you're going more horizontal, whereas trampolining, you go in vertical. Yeah. So when I, I remember I jumped on a trampoline for the first time you and near enough off. fell off it because <laughs> I, I sent myself horizontally instead of up and I was like, oh yeah, I like this, I'll give it another go. Um, and then, yeah, so I was like dabbling into both and then I was getting to a, I was sort of at like national level for the tumbling. So I'd how, done, how old were you then when you were doing national level? So like maybe like 11 to 12 and then oh, 13 yeah. was sort of that transition year for me and I thought... I wanted to give trampolining a go. I feel like the people, I had a lot of good friends there as well and I liked being around them all. And yeah, so did that for a few years and then managed to land myself onto Team GB for... So you've got trampolining, yeah. then you've got another thing called yeah, double yeah. mini trampoline called DMT. Oh, sure. It's not yeah. a drug. Whenever I tell <laughs> people I used to do DMT, they think I had some drug addiction, but I did it when I was 14. Could, could explain a few things. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I made it onto Team GB for that, and when I was 14, I competed at Daytona Beach, Florida at World Championships. So 
that was a good experience. I feel like because I was very young, I hadn't quite matured yet into sport, and it was quite a gymnastics is a quite a ruthless yeah. sort of sport. Like everything is very strict and quite like yeah. perf- everything's performance focused. Like when you're at your camps, like everything was spot on. Like you're eating, you're sleeping. I think at that age, not that I wasn't ready for that, but I think it was like. I'd gone from having loads of fun with my friends just starting off when I was 13 to the next year. It was like, oh, this is quite like, yeah. like it gets serious. And I got I got a taste for that. And obviously being around the seniors at the time as well. I think at the time I thought like, this is what I want to do. I want to make a career out of gymnastics. But yeah, I feel like I had an injury because I did suffer from mental blocks quite a bit. When I was about 15, I sort of tore a load of ligaments on my left my right ankle and I think at that point I was kind of because I still hadn't matured into sport yet I feel like I didn't really know what I wanted and for me I thought "Mm, is gymnastics really the sport for me and then gave it a little bit of a miss and decided I'd give it like leave do athletics on the side for fun then found CrossFit and literally ever since then. I do feel like in gymnastics because the people you know at the high level the age that people are competing is very very young um i do feel like you've got to almost accelerate your emotional intelligence when you're younger to be able to deal with you know the pressure to win the world championships and competing against seniors i feel like that's you know it's Competing against someone that's 21 when you're 14. Well, like this, say, I, I don't know what the, the stats are on this, but you watch you, you watch the gymnastics, obviously, the likes of um, Simone Biles and what's her oh, training partner called? I can't remember. The taller brunette girl. They've kind of they've kind of put. I feel anyway for me, gymnastics kind of on the mat made it yeah. a bit more like. Um, that like Simone Biles is quite like a more of a well be a well built like a gymnast yeah. sort of feeling, and, and to me like they they changed the game a little bit in gymnastics and they were probably at the top end end range of what gymnasts were like yeah. everyone they're competing against are generally younger than them mm-hmm. and they were the early, early 20s so yeah it is very like as a sport like the peak age is is young, yeah. is young yeah. like yeah. really young I feel like it did especially sort of the discipline that you're required like people didn't hold your hand they expected you to crack on and do it I think one thing that's slightly different with CrossFit I think one thing with well gymnastics did definitely help with sort of like the discipline side I feel like that transferred well to CrossFit because it's like with CrossFit you it's the effort you put in like you can have your program given to you you can have the best coach in the world but you need to be able to do what you need what what's expected of you to that standard to excel almost and I feel like that's one thing that gymnastics has helped me with it's sort of I'll read my program and if it says it's for time, I'm like, right, that's for time. And I have to speak to myself and I'm like, you're not holding back. Like, yeah. if it hurts, it's for time. If if something's 8 to 10 RPE, like, I'm, I'm going at that effort. And I feel like gymnastics has definitely helped me sort of drill that in because you were expected at the squad, at the training camps to be at your best every single time or yeah. give your best effort. And it, it wouldn't, they almost wouldn't let you... Yeah. slack or that wouldn't be allowed to like slide and I feel like that's definitely sort of helped me keep keep on top of the high standard in my training whether I'm yeah. training by myself or training with other people yeah what was the, what was the training regime like then from like nine years old to like 15 when you, when you um, stopped like and how did it progress over those six years so the hours were a lot less than CrossFit yeah um, obviously I was in school at the time so I'd I remember generally I'd probably train on a Monday Wednesday Friday Saturday um, go to Is school or high school nine? yeah pretty yeah. much I'd go to school um, come back eat my tea and then I'd pretty much go straight to the gym um, probably be a two hour session but the majority of that especially when I was a double mini trampolinist the majority of that was conditioning so an hour conditioning yep. an hour double mini session an hour conditioning so it was quite full on within that period and then Obviously, having a few more days off than CrossFit, I feel like the recovery period was okay. Like, I'd have a Tuesday off where I might might have gone to athletics and had a bit of a laugh with my friends. And then same with a, a Sunday, really, like, doing whatever I wanted. But, yeah, the hours were more sort of confined. Condensed, yeah, yeah, condensed. Yeah. But obviously, with school and everything around that, whereas when I had a national squad, that would be a full, intense weekend 
of yeah. training, yeah. eating, recovering, yeah. more training. <laughs> when you, Also, when you say conditioning, is that gymnastics conditioning? Or, yeah, so very core-based, yeah. very... I remember they we had, like, you know, the gymnastics pits. I remember on, like, a Saturday we might have more of a... Not an endurance session as such, but it would be, like, a circuit. So you'd do a load of laps of the gym. You'd be running through the foam pit. It was, yeah. like, quite intense. You'd have different exercises i remember the first time someone handed me i think it was a two and a half or a five kilo plate to hold a plank and i thought yeah. that that weight was the heaviest thing i ever <laughs> held in my life i was like geez and then yeah obviously thinking back now especially with doing what i'm doing i look back and i think like i think i used to think i was really well conditioned back then and i could face anything when i first started crossfit i thought oh this will be a piece of cake i've done gymnastics <laughs> and it hit me hard like yeah so, but you did so you know the like the national training camps and stuff mm -hmm. you had was that with other like youth level gb athletes senior level gb athletes like what what did those training camps look like yeah so whereas we're crossfit the age group kind of cuts at 17 gymnastics mm -hmm. has a little bit longer so you had an 11 to 12 division mm -hmm. a 13 to 14 division 15 to 16 and then it went to senior after that. I think they had a 17 to 18, but you could choose depending on whether you were good enough. If you if you were high enough level, you yeah. could compete as a senior at that age. Um, so a lot of the time they'd have the junior camps and then they'd also have a senior camp running at the same time, but we'd have different training times, but we were still able to sort of observe and see what all the older athletes mm -hmm. were doing. And yeah, it was quite inspiring really to see. How, how often were them? How often were them training camps? Um, seasonally, I'd say so every three months. Yeah, cool. I think I only right. really had one full year on the team as in 2015, I had that injury. Um, yeah. And I was actually due a training camp, I think the week after. But at that point I was like, my ankles completely spangled. Yeah, I was like, yeah, we're not going to that. But um, yeah, they tended to be every like three months. And then if you qualified for say European championships, world championships, they had a few more, they were a bit more frequent in the yeah. lead up to that. That tended to be around like November time, December time. Was that something you looked forward to is those, I don't know, bigger training camps or again, how was training on a daily basis? Did you enjoy? Cause Five, was it four times a week you're training like yeah. four or five times a week which I guess if you're in the routine at that age and you yeah know, you, did you enjoy it or did you, your parents have to kind of you know pull you out of bed to do it or <laughs> <laughs> um I did enjoy it I think I preferred the camps I think the thought of meeting up with friends seeing friends that obviously you don't see very often because with being on the team people were dotted all around the country like knowing that I was going to catch up with my friends and see them that was sort of something that really excited me I feel like when I was coming to the end of sort of my gymnastics career I was enjoying it a little bit less and personally for me that was because I suffered quite bad from mental blocks so I get quite yeah. bad move confusion and something that I struggled with was how I spoke to myself instead of thinking about the move I would think like am I going to get injured and that sort of thought process is not ideal at all especially mm -hmm. when you're wanting to progress and you're wanting to be one of the top in the sport it was sort of that mental side for me that almost let me down in that part of my gymnastics career and um, with regards to my mum and dad never once have they ever had to sort of drag me out of bed right. everything I've ever done has That's always good. been because I've wanted to do it and yeah. they've just been really they're, they're amazing they're just really really supportive have supported me with any decision I've ever yeah. made really so when you got injured at 15 what like what decision did you decide to to make then um and how did you deal with that or did did you not deal with it so well or you know how how um, was that kind of period I feel like I definitely struggled to sort of mentally to come back from that and I think the thought of doing it again and knowing that I was almost I felt like I was torturing myself trying to do the moves that my body just didn't yeah. feel ready to do and um, I feel like if I maybe had you know how there's a lot of mindset coaches out there nowadays especially in CrossFit and like they are great and they they really do help people with how they sort of mentally cope with things I feel like at a young age when I didn't really know what I wanted and because I sort of built it up as in my head before I did it it was almost as if I'd 
like, I don't know how to say it. It's almost as if I'd anticipated it to happen. I was almost yeah. waiting for an injury because I'd the way I'd spoke to myself about it. And I feel like that was one thing that I really struggled to come back from. And almost like the thought of it happening again kind of scared me away. And I just thought, I feel like I can't yeah. cope mentally with that. And that's one thing with sort of what I'm doing now where I've definitely improved. And instead of speaking to myself in such a in a negative way and almost speaking myself into it, potentially hurting myself because mm -hmm. my body was would react in a different way. I've definitely like overcome that obstacle a lot more. So uh, without jumping f too far forward, I would just want to stay at that mm -hmm. period a bit more, but what have you learned from that period when you got injured that you like apply into your training now? So like you said, rather than focusing on the negative, I guess you focus more on the positive now, but are there any other kind of tips or strategies that you that you have that have kind of really helped? Um, I think I just when I see like a workout or something, I just see it as it is instead of overthinking it. I'll come up with a strategy instead of thinking like, oh, like it, is this snatch weight gonna like my elbows hyperextend? I've I always used to be quite lanky like that. Instead of thinking like is my elbow going to go? I think, like, right, how am I going to attack this movement so that it's going to go well? And sometimes I feel like in a workout when you're a bit more tired, I feel like you almost give yourself that extra bit of energy and that's what sort of made me refrain from thinking like that. And I think, obviously, knowing that I've done things in the past and thinking, like, well, I've hit a one rep max in the past, which used to be heavy for me, like, I'm strong enough to lift this weight now. Like, it's, it's the same as back then because it's all relative that like the way I sort of speak to myself has definitely helped and I think when I hurt myself snapping my Achilles a couple of years ago the way I sort of came back from that and the way I spoke to myself during that I've almost like I'm grateful enough to be able to be even training and come back from that kind of injury so I think like it's definitely the way I've conditioned my mind and the way I speak to myself as been like a massive help with sort of overcoming those kind of barriers yeah i think i touched on your achilles i think i've watched a few people rehab and come back from you know pretty serious well it required surgery didn't it yeah. so sort of pretty serious injuries and yeah i think like that's one thing that he did do really well on it whether it helped because it was locked down at the time and you were just kind of you could you had no other choice than just to like sit in your house and rehab every day um but yeah like really did come back from that injury very well. How much, what I want to go back to is how much of the whole gymnastics kind of like attitude, like you said, it was everything was very performance focused, like outcome based. How much do you feel like that had an effect on how you had, how you used to have those thought processes about like worrying that the outcome was going to be either not good enough or an injury or like how, and, and did that may or may not have contributed to the um, did you call it move confusion, like the mental blocks? Yeah. Like, how much would you say that 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 whole culture of it all being about your performance played in the role? Would it or wouldn't it? Um, I think, especially like gymnastics, especially the selection process for say like a competition, it is very much how you perform on a day. It's not necessarily about who you are as a person. It's not necessarily about anything like that. It's more to do with like what you do and what you show to the judges that score that number was what was basically make or break with situations and i think knowing that i needed to i was getting a bit older and the skills needed to go up i think the pressure of that obviously then struggling with the mental side they were would clash quite a lot and i think like i was almost trying to force my body to do something that my mind was like I don't know, like it just went into fuzz that's all I can describe it as and then it'd be like I'd think of a basic skill so there's a thing called a brani and it's basically a front somersault with a half twist and at that when I was 15 I was trying to learn how to do a thing called a rudy out which is a double front somersault with a one and a half twist and the second somersault and because I was that blurred with that I'm confused already things, <laughs> things, like, things like a basic brani then became fuzz as well and it was almost as if I had to completely strip down and I think knowing that competitions were approaching and that I had to be at a certain standard like to obviously qualify for British championships and then hopefully like world championships um, knowing that 
it very much went on the performance. It was quite hard to kind of escape that mindset because I think I went straight to panic mode instead of thinking about the situation and how I could actually like sort it out. Yeah, and I think what you have to remember here is you're around about 13 years old at this stage. Yeah. And like a 13 year old doesn't compute information at the best of times, yeah. just for normal information. So putting yourself in this high pressure situation on a, like a, well, a world international and national stage, like it is a lot for a 13 year old yeah. um, to compute. And that's why like, I coach a few teens at the moment. Um, Phoebe, who's just turned 14, um, and just very conscious of of that, like everything there, mm-hmm. of like how much information and expectation, and how much of everything's just th- thrown at her. Like, we tr- we were trying to help her over the weekend with like structuring her nutrition better so she can get to the gym in the evening yeah. with more fuel. But it's then like, how much do you go in depth with yeah. nutrition to a 14 year old girl? Because like this. They, they need to develop and take on the information over, over time rather than it all being so like intense and condensed into like this two three year period when you've not like your body and your brain hasn't even developed as yeah it is. i think as well at that age you really need to enjoy it and you need to love it and yeah. because like when you're when you're younger and obviously if parents want their kids to to take part in things it's like they're able to sort of be like yep come on let's go like we're you're doing this whereas as you get older and if you want to actually make a career out of it I feel like you've got to you can't lose sight of that love for the thing because for example like I'm doing a degree in sports science and I think the information is very interesting but I don't love it as much as I love CrossFit and I know that even if I'm having a bad day with training like I'll still gladly do the training or I'll still be, like try and yeah. sort out my mindset for it whereas sometimes if I find every topic like within any topic you enjoy there's obviously going to be things that you find more boring I find that like say I'm learning about a certain topic I'm almost like oh like I've got to force myself to do it but I feel like when you if you love something and you can maintain that it's like you'll you'll naturally sort yeah. of get better and exceed especially at a younger age when you've got a lot of improvement I think it's an important important thing to, to point out to you know athletes at any level is and I think what we've found as we've like been around people trying to turn to the more just professional CrossFit where you, you got your, your job is training CrossFit day in day out when that when that used to be the, like the thing that well, when that's the thing that you enjoy and the thing that you love doing and then you take away any, any of the other areas that are like like, like you say studying some of the mm-hmm. um, some of the the subjects or whatever or some of the work shifts that some people might used to do that they would class as boring and a bit of hindrance when you take that boring thing away I think you lose sometimes lose perspective a little bit in really training yeah because because you just all you've got to do that like day to day is training yeah and I think it's clear to see obviously from from you compared to um you know the rest of the athletes are here um I think a couple of them like Phil Roy does a bit of work for us I think George does a little bit of her nutrition stuff, and I think she, she does something with her parents out, yeah. outside the gym as well. Um, but you've probably got more going on than, than the others. Um, and it's, it's interesting, interesting to see kind of like, like you, you aren't here at the gym like all day, mm-hmm. every day you've got windows that you have to fit your training in. Yeah. Whether that just kind of, that just forces like a bit more like structure and a bit more purpose. Yeah. Because you know that like when you're in the gym, you've, got to, you've really got to make that time. Yeah count um i think i think that does actually it does really help and i, I, I talked to you yesterday about that podcast that, that i listened to with uh, the high performance guys and greg hoffman and he was talking about you know kobe bryant and other elite athletes and he said they were very curious just about other areas and they had other things going on as well as like the sport that they were doing and he he said that um what was really interesting is that like they could be looking at something else and be into something else and then try and apply some stuff from that area into the sport that they're doing like somehow like there's always some crossover in something whether you're looking at like he gave architecture as an an example and he said how we can apply it into design you know like designing shoes and stuff like that and it's like you know you draw inspiration from different places and like with your you know university and your course now there's obviously stuff that you can apply to what you're doing in CrossFit as well. 100%. But same with other areas that you might not quite see the same connection. There is stuff you can apply, like working at Hollister as well, like being able to talk to people 
and you know yeah, build a relationship with them mm-hmm. yeah like one of the first things I remember when I first met you at train train Manchester was how kind of warm you were bubbly like easy to talk to very happy yeah. and just brought like a great kind of you know atmosphere around you and I feel like that's maybe something you've developed from you know your enjoyment from your gymnastics or the Hollister or wherever you have like you might not have made that connection yet but it's just little things like that that you know you can pass on to the sport that you that you do as well I feel like there's advantages and disadvantages to obviously having other things going on so with uni it's like if I'm if I'm a bit stressed about training or if, say, I have a bad session, it's like I've got to switch off from it because I know that there's a lecture that I've got to do. Whereas, obviously, last year when I didn't make semi-finals, but obviously I still had a great off-season, like, I was able to train and that was during the period where I didn't have uni, so all of my mental energy could go towards, like, right, I'm trying to get stronger, like, thinking about my numbers. Everything else was, like, on point because I didn't have like other external factors to think about I think it's a bit of a trade-off because I've mad like I think it's all about balance as well and sort of how you obviously your recovery and everything is vital it's so important but I think as well as that like things outside the gym that you can do to switch off is also a very important thing and I think that's one thing that uni's definitely like almost enabled me to do because if I've had a bad session if I've got to learn about EMG or <laughs> physical activity, like I've, I've got to switch off and do it. SPS and all that. SPSS. Yeah. yeah. Still trying to get my head around it. Around it. <laughs> yeah, well, well, don't ask me. <laughs> so before you like started CrossFit, I found CrossFit. Mm-hmm. Did you go to the gym and do anything before that? What kind of what was in between injuring yourself in you know trampolining mm-hmm. and then getting into CrossFit? What kind of was in that period? Um, I had that embarrassing gym stage where I went <laughs> and I thought I knew what I was doing. <laughs> Hop on the row, row 200 metres. Oh, that's me done for the day. Like, I, um, so I was doing athletics whilst I was trampolining, um, just on the side, just a little bit of fun. I had quite a lot of friends there. It was at Liverpool Harriers. And um, I remember my tumbling coach. I had a really good relationship with him. Um, he was very, like... I don't know, he just, see, he very, he believed that I should be doing heptathlon. So he would encourage it. He'd be like, oh, you need to get into athletics. He'd say to my mum, she needs to get into athletics. Um, and I gave it a go. I wasn't like, I've always been like good at like a number of things, never like unbelievable, but like obviously it transfers quite well to CrossFit because you've got to be all round but I enjoyed it but it just didn't just didn't really do it for me I don't there's no other way to describe it but I thought yeah I'll do that and then I thought I'll go to the gym alongside that do some what I used to think was strength and conditioning <laughs> for the athletics and I just I was clueless I was 15 no idea um, and then I remember my mum came across CrossFit online and she was like oh there's a there's a gym not that far down the road. Like, me me and your dad are going to go. Like, you should try it. And I, I remember she showed me a video of it, and I thought, I'm not doing that. I was like, I'm not <laughs> I was like, why would I do that? Like, conditioning was hard enough when I was doing gymnastics. And then she was like, no, 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 try it. Like, you'll, you'll probably be shocked. You'll be, you'll be good at it. And I was like, Mum, I don't really, I, I don't really know. And then eventually I gave in, and I gave it a go. And I remember I was doing yeah. burpees, but I was doing the gymnastics style burpees where you kind of went into a front support your chest didn't touch the floor right. and I remember the guy that owned the gym and um, my first ever cross the gym he was like they're not proper burpees and I was like <laughs> yes they are I've been doing them like this all my life and I remember picking up a three kilo war ball and I was throwing it nowhere near the target god knows what I was doing and like yeah so transition and then afterwards I was like you know what like it, it booted me up the arse I didn't realize it was that hard and I was like I, I could could get used to this I quite like it and because when I was sort of trying to go to the gym and somehow get fit with the lack of knowledge I had at the time I sort of realized like well I want to get fitter I want to I don't just want to be sitting around like for me I've never wanted to just sit on a couch all day watching tv like I've always wanted to be out and about um and yeah I thought well that's got more structure to it and it's a lot better than what I'm trying to make myself do, so <laughs> gave it a go and I look at me now. <laughs> <laughs> so where did you start that CrossFit journey, what gym? 
Um, CrossFit Semper Eternal was yes. my first ever gym. Oh, I was, yeah. yeah, I was there for about 18 months and then I went to peak performance in Liverpool for a few for a few years. I found that there was a lot of younger people there, like my age, <coughs> and they were all very eager and wanted to compete. And I just thought like, well, that's a, that's a good environment to sort of be in, like especially because everyone was a lot younger and oh, we were all doing the teenage comps together and yeah, yeah it was... It was good. I've enjoyed the journey so far. So, so how, <laughs> how far into doing CrossFit did you kind of get that thought? Hmm, I wouldn't like. I would fancy a comp, like a fancy competing in this. Um, like I fancy my chances, like. So when I was at San Paternal, there was a. T- I think it was called Scale the Heights. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That that was sort of like advertised and. Lisa, my friend who owns partly owns the gym, she was like, "Oh, why don't you give it a go?" And I was like. Yeah, like, I don't, don't really know what it entails, but yeah, I'll give it a go. I did the qualifiers, and I won the qualifiers. This was in the teenage division. Um, and I was like, ooh, like, I don't I don't mind this. So I did that, um, and I ended up winning that, and I think sort of the rush from that, I was like, oh, I feel like I could potentially get better. I remember I only had one season as a teenager, and at that point, I think I'd only been doing CrossFit about six months. Right. I feel like I majorly underestimated how good people were I think I was like oh I'm smashing these age group online qualifiers <laughs> and the, the workouts booted me everywhere I, I remember there was a clean ladder I couldn't even clean the second weight and I was like yeah there's definitely a lot of work to be done <laughs> and I think then like I my respect for the sport went up massively I realized how hard it actually is and sort of how hard people work and how like well-rounded people are like seeing people my age lift certain weights that I couldn't even imagine lifting and I was like wow and yeah sort of competing in the teenage division sort of got it going and then I did European championships when I was I think I'd just turned 18 so I'd just gone into the the women's and I made the semi-final bit of that and I came I think in the top 20 and obviously that was against like at the time the big girls so I was like oh like uh, I like this I did Rain Hill a fair few times and I remember I came second when I was 17 in Rocket Um, and yeah I feel like just doing it and competing against different people it sort of made me realize like I get a buzz from these competitions and it was I enjoyed testing myself and Yeah, it's what, I th- what I think is really good and actually really valuable, valuable for other people at any level, at any age, sorry, like trying to get into competitive CrossFit is starting and doing, like say, scale the heights. Not yeah. many people might not remember what, what, what that was like, but it was like, well, it's just, it was a scale competition, really. Mm-hmm. It wasn't for elite athletes and then doing, you know, doing, doing your rain and all If you did it a few times, I presume you'd have started maybe in a lower category or did you just go straight into rocket? Went straight into oh, rocket. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but like doing a rain hill trials and then like European championship and you've gone, so they're like scale of heights, rain hill trials, European championships. You progressively like what we always say, like going up in divisions in terms of like mm-hmm. the standard that you're at. And I feel like a lot of people, they want to get straight to European championships yeah. or they want to get straight to semi-finals. And it's like, you have to go through those motions and make your mistakes at scale heights, make yeah. your mistakes at renal trials, like learn everything there, rather than just staying in and training and training and training and trying to get to get to semi-finals and yeah. then either not making it or making your mistakes at that point. I feel yeah. like there's a lot to, to learn for athletes just to go through those lower level competitions. I did it. You did a you did a few, did you? Did you just did regionals? Well, you did it. You're a strong man. I did come yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 beat me, a strong man. <laughs> um, yeah, but like I did it and made some big, very big mistakes, yeah. like in these small competitions. Um, and I feel like that helped me massively when you when you get to the bigger comps. Definitely. Big time. That's if you don't, you know, if you don't fail, if you don't, you know, make mistakes. At that point, you know, when you get to the bigger competitions, you're either gonna completely poo your pants and just yep. lose also your head. Like appreciation of the bigger competitions yeah. as well. If you've seen like a scale of the heights, if I remember correctly, it was just in like a box, wasn't it? In like someone's gym, like yeah. a bigger gym. Yeah, it was like 3D. Like a, was it 3D? I think it was 3D. Was um, it? Or was it in like Yorkshire somewhere? I think it was in Yorkshire. Was yeah, I think they had two actually. So that I think because. Obviously, it was like oh, yeah, a northern one, that. and then a southern mm. one, and the final. I remember it was in a skate park, huh. and I was trying to do like jump over a wall. And there was this guy just coming past on a scooter. <laughs> I was like, oh. But like then you then 
like when you do go up to like renal trials which is in now it's in an arena and mm-hmm. it's like spectators there around yeah. barriers and you've got warm pairs and then you go to your european yeah. championships which is like a, a big arena and more people watching like you can put like everything's progressing yeah i think it's the way that you've got to do it rather than just setting out a goal that you want to get to the games and then just not competing until yeah you, some, if, some, until you maybe make semi-finals it's true that um and it's similar when so when people approach us and say oh i want individual programming and like you you go to do a bit of research about about the the person because they said oh like i want to get to semi-finals you know and you've seen that they've come fifteen thousand from in one open and you're like let's just take a few steps back here before we actually yeah. start to move forward and set set some you know checkpoints along the way rather than looking yeah. too far ahead yeah i think at that point i was very much just dabbling in and out of classes like after school i'd go arrive to the gym a few hours before the class and just I mean, I'm that guilty person that would max out every single day um, <laughs> and just hope for the best. But, like, almost get everything, like, like, do as much as I could. And then I feel like the nerves are always the same, no matter what the competition is. Like, I'll always be nervous. I feel like it's more just knowing I'm going to put my body in a world of pain. Like, yeah. it's all relative, whether you like, me now versus me when I was 17. I was still, it's all relative, the pain. You're still putting yourself through the same yeah. workout. Um, and, yeah, I just remember... Like the, the the nerves are there, but the pressure wasn't as much, I think, because I had didn't have an expectation on myself. Like when I was 17, 18, doing Rain Hill, I just thought, go as hard as you can, <laughs> as fast as you can. I remember there was this workout and it was like, I think the final workout had a 200 meter run at the start. And I was just like, forgot the rest of the workout, like you said about making mistakes. And I was like, I'm winning this 200 meter run, <laughs> yeah. even though there's a ton of stuff to do afterwards. Oh, it, remi- but yeah, like, it reminds me of like the earlier competitions I did was called Manchester Games or Central Manchester Games, and it was it was in the courtyard of, of someone's gym, like basically it was the car park of someone's gym. And I remember I would watch videos back, and it could be an eight minute AMRAP or something, like an eight minute workout, and three well, you have to run to your barbell, and everyone is literally like just sprinting as fast as I can like there's like thrusters and lunges and it's like super fast thrusters and like lunges 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 and thrust 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 and it's like everything was in like fast forward yeah. as fast as you could go from the very first second and then everyone hit like three minutes and everyone was just just, just wrecked <laughs> it was just that. like that was just accepted that that's yeah. how you did crossfit you just yeah. went super hard from the first minute yeah and then you just hit a wall and then you, and it was that was the grind like gush, pushing through that wall was I think it's advanced quite yeah. a lot now but part of me does miss that just being able to have that mind frame of just like right well this is Here the workout it's getting sent 100 mile an hour yeah. from like the very get go and I'll deal with the pain as yeah well. literally <laughs> so you said you decided to train at peak performance mm-hmm. so at what point did you make that decision and also you used to train with Sam Briggs on a weekly basis as well yeah. like how did how did that come across because i'm sure that helps a lot as well um so peak performance was around so i've been doing crossfit for 18 months and then i think i was going into i was pretty i'm pretty sure i was in sixth form mm-hmm. it was around 2017 when i made that move um what made that decision like why were you like oh, i'm gonna go there now so i had a friend called holly that i used to met through scale the heights funnily Mm -hmm. enough um and went and trained with her a few times and got to meet a few of the other teenagers and i just feel like being around people my age especially like i just thought i feel like i'll thrive here a bit more like i'll it was like everyone was racing everyone was really competitive but it was never like that savage competitiveness Mm -hmm. it was always like a joke at the end of it we'd be laughing smiling um so i was training there pretty much as much as I could at the start was when I was in school Mm -hmm. high school it was very much like go after go after um school pretty much every single day train on a Saturday Saturdays would be the best because I'd be like oh I've got the whole day to like play about (laughs) um and then when I went on my gap year um so I went to train Manchester when I was about 17 or so um got to meet Sam Briggs trained with her Sammy Rob and Isla um for every saturday for quite a while and then when i i think i had a little bit of a break from that when i was sitting exams and then when i was on my gap year 
um, sort of got in touch and asked if I could come and train again and it kind of became like a regular thing where on a Saturday we'd all do Briggsy's Saturday training and it was Absolutely intense but I honestly like them Saturdays like I missed them they were honestly they were great it was just everyone was just putting themselves in a world of pain having fun doing it and it was just honestly like everyone was just great to be around and even when I used to come to JST and mm -hmm. um, especially when Evie and you were training there yeah. and, and you Jack like I used to love it just just buzzing off training with everyone and yeah like they they were good yeah the, I, I think I, cause I, I used to do quite a few horrendous sessions with, with Briggsy <laughs> but you know what like having someone like Briggsy I think you know I was training with her I trained with her a little bit before when she in 2013 when she won the games mm -hmm. and then more so kind of in a couple of years after but just knowing that like right you go in head to head with like Briggsy in this workout she's the best in the world let's say it was a chipper with war balls done last time or something she's going to get the best score in the world so you just know for a fact that right that's the level that you yeah need. and it was just plain and simple and however many minutes she beat you by or however maybe she beat you by five minutes one week and it was a similar-ish type style workout the next time and then it was four minutes like, just having her there and just like training by her and just experience to just wipe the floor with you like yeah. multiple times for me that just gave me like in terms of how much i needed to push in workouts just the feedback that you just need as an athlete is to like yeah. that's someone who's the best in the world that's what needs to be done yeah. so like in your training b sessions before next time you'd go and you know do the saturday with her yeah that was in your head is like well the only way i'm gonna get close to it is if i send this rowing session this bike session all these like, other little yeah. bits that's going to get you anywhere near her even as a person like i've i've always looked up to her like the like when i first ever went i moved like a bag of spanners i remember trying to snatch <laughs> and I, I could not snatch well at all and the fact that like i was nowhere near where i wanted to be with crossfit i was very much still quite new to it and the fact that she would help me and try to give me all the tips that she could and then obviously going back in my gap year a few years later when i had time to develop at like even then like she's just an unbelievable person to have trained around like so helpful honestly like just her character and how she is with people is just amazing and then um, that massively helped me with filthy 150 when i was yes. 19 so Obviously, I've, I'd known her for a bit through training, and she massively helped me that weekend as well. And yeah, she's someone that I'll always look up to and almost have to thank because yeah. she, uh, the, she. And do you know what the good thing is? I think there's probably a lot of people who would just who would say the same thing, and that speaks. Yeah. I think that speaks volumes. For yeah. her. Like it's not just one or two people that she's helped. Like it is probably hundreds people she's around the world that much that she's probably helped people in different <laughs> areas of the world and just in spite in, how many people in the uk is she you know inspired yeah. from you know yeah. what, she, what she's done um and you don't she's, and she's 14 she's still <laughs> and she's yeah. still yeah. slogging away still snooping <laughs> ass <laughs> um what i want to come back to kind of at this point now is so i think it was 20 2019 2018 come back basically i think it was 2018 you were like seven and 1700 in the world and then the year after you jumped up to like 220th in the world or something like that it might have been the two years be year before that um but can you remember what was the difference between that year where you came 1700th in the world and to the year that you came 220th um so the year before i feel like the open very much was just kind of like for fun at the time and i feel like at that point i was just trying to see where i was with different workouts different elements of crossfit compared was regionals 2018 was yeah, regionals yeah. was still a thing yeah. i think like one of my events may have been like close to the top 20 and i think for me i was i was absolutely buzzing over that obviously the rest of them weren't <laughs> weren't as good but um the year after, that was when we had two Opens in one year, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so the second Open was when I came around, well, that, that bit of better improvement. And I think I'd had a taste of, obviously my gap year gave me a taste of being a full-time athlete. Didn't really have any other, I had a lot of things in my routine that could have been a lot better, like my eating, my sleep, sort of how I approached my training. But 
I sort of had that time still just to focus on training and I feel like I realised then, I'd, I think I'd done two, I'd done Sid and French Throwdown before yeah. that open and I think both those experiences like sort of fueled a fire where I was like yeah I, like this is what I want and I think that open was when I sort of realised I was like we're, we're going to give it a good shot and we're just going to see like where we can like place out compared to everyone and um, so yeah I think that experience of not having A levels to worry about not having other stresses to worry about I think just going in training having fun with it and um, not putting pressure on myself I think that was sort of what like a major factor that contributed to sort of like that improvement because I could train more hours in the day train instead of doing classes as well it was obviously more specific mm -hmm. to what I need to get needed to get better at so that was probably what the main reason yeah. I'd say and then so last year you came 202nd in the world yes and this year you've come 79th in the world i think that's in the i don't know if that's open or age category online qualifiers that was the open. But, the open, yeah. yeah the open um so again what's changed from last year to this year like um, is anything around training changed or i don't know anything and so, you could probably partly answer this as well steve I feel like, obviously, in t start of 2020, just started working with Steve. It was probably about two, three months in. Ruptured my Achilles fully. So I think, obviously, the lead up to that last year's season was very different. It doesn't sort sound of. great for me, that, does it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I was in a few too many box jumps, but I rebounded them like an idiot. So, like, you live and learn, really. Like, everyone used to say to me, you don't want to be rebounding box jumps too much, but when you're racing, you're racing. So that was my own fault, really. But freak accidents happen, and I feel like I couldn't have been happy. Like, I can't scrutinise, like, my recovery process. Yeah. Like, Steve's been, like, I, I cannot thank you enough for that, really, because I feel like that was a major, like, sort of the programming that was given, especially during lockdown, sort of kept me on top of everything, and mm -hmm. everything was perfect, really. Yeah, I think we managed to turn what could be a lot of negatives in terms of, you know, like, you were supposed to compete a few times that year, weren't you? We had, yeah. And you, you were in a couple of teams that we were putting together when it was all sanctionals year, going over to the US in one of the teams. Mm -hmm. like it was it was set for, like, quite an exciting year. And then, obviously, lockdown hit, and you sat your Achilles all within, like, a couple of months, and then you're going into surgery, and you managed to actually turn what could potentially be quite, like, could be enough for some people just to pack it in. Yeah. To, like, quite a negative experience into something that's probably shaped, like, a lot of the reason why you know I've had the success in the last yeah so touching years. on that it's snapping your achilles was there anything you were kind of again strategies or tips or anything you were kind of focusing on after you did that to kind of not you know dig yourself a bigger hole and go into this you know mental hole where you can't get yourself out i think i felt like i didn't want what could potentially turn into a career for me to just end like that and i think i was like working with Steve, I was on top of everything. I was really grateful that I was even like, the, like I'd been on JST, I was really excited about that. And I think I was determined to not let an injury, like with my gymnastics, where mentally I struggled too much. I was like, I'm not letting an injury get in the way. And I, I was sure on what I wanted at that point. I think that the sanctioned events, when they were a thing, they made me realize what I wanted. And I thought like, I'm not, I'm not letting that get in the way so I think lockdown definitely did help I know for a lot of people it was a very kind of hard time but I think in the not to sound selfish but it almost because knowing everyone else was in a situation where we were all locked in lockdown I didn't see anything on Instagram where like people were training in gyms I I was very much in a similar I saw it as I'm in the same position as everyone else I I'm not able to train obviously for my Achilles, other people, because gyms were closed, but I felt like Instagram and online can be, obviously, like, it's not necessarily reality at times, yeah. and I feel like you can get consumed in it, and it almost allowed me to switch off and just focus on my rehab, and obviously had about six months of rehab before walking, and then just in the lead-up to that season, we were sort of lifting again, yeah. building back fitness, and I sort of managed to get myself a pretty decent level of fitness for that open obviously my weightlifting wasn't quite there yet but with what I'd experienced a couple of months prior like I didn't have the expectation to be yeah. like a ridiculously strong but 
yeah, um, I think mentally I coped with that a lot better than I think I've learned from situations in the past, which has helped me cope yeah. better. Yeah, I think I think also, and I think why you dealt with the, the setback quite well is um, obviously we we had sat down before this injury when we started working together, and it was like right, where do we want to get to, and what's the process to get there? And we realised that we needed to improve your movement mechanics, improve kind of like your lifting tech, well, improve your movement mechanics before your lifting technique could improve as well. And just kind of like that in that the day of the injury came, you remember it, you snatched a PB, did you not? Or it was like an I'd equal like PB. I'd like equal PB. And we'd done like quite a lot of work on move mechanics and then it was like, right, well, we're just going to test the waters and you, you'd hit this equal PB, but with the better technique that we've yeah. been drilling, if you, if, you, if you remember. But then kind of obviously hit, they got the setback like literally half an hour later. Um, and then saw that more of an opportunity to continue changing it or improving your movement mechanics so that when you did return back to full training you know without having to work around um your achilles like you were kind of you weren't in a better position but your your body was in a position where it could get much better because the amount of work that you've done on the re not just the rehab of your ankle but then also seeing the fact that right well i can't lift so i'm going to make sure that like all these countless side lunges yeah. and uh, overhead, um, overhead lunge and everything else that we had you doing is going to help me be in a better position yeah. than I was pre-injury. I'm so. like a strong believer in everything happens for a reason as well. And I feel like I look at that injury as a positive experience. It didn't feel great, but <laughs> like it almost, I just see it as it almost gave me the opportunity to yeah. strip everything back and to literally especially with my lifting and my movement to literally start from scratch instead of like here and there maybe being tempted to like do a heavy lift when realistically I'm trying to build a better base it almost like made me completely strip back and start from the bottom of the pyramid and like build my way back up again and you see, and you, you see it quite often actually um some people some people not that it was kind of like a relief that you get injured sometimes when you do get an injury it kind of does help you just comp change your complete mindset of just like oh like like I'm a bit relieved now i can actually now just change my focus and you're not just trying to like chasing chasing training and chasing yeah. performances all the time but you've just, you've got to, you have got to look at like if anyone goes through like a a bad injury you have got to look at the like what the opportunity could get from this time that yeah. you maybe can't use your lower body um you know how can how can you come back yeah. better from it with, with what you can do to echo to echo that it's you know you've got to pivot don't you like you might be focusing on this but then it's a chance to just switch direction and be like well i can't work on that so i'll focus on this area instead yeah. there's always something that you can yeah. you, you know be getting better at even if you know, it's not you, what your initial focus was. It's still going to help you ultimately to watch your, yeah, what you're working to longer term. Um, training now? Yeah, so... What, like, challenges in training? I want to kind of go into that a little bit more. Yeah. So, like, how, how has the training been kind of this last year um, for you? What has been kind of the the main things that you've been working on and trying to trying to address um so a big hole that was identified last season was I need to get stronger but i think there was a lot of challenges sort of from that that i needed to sort out so not only just like obviously doing the training and getting stronger but things like my eating weren't exactly like my eating was clean and i ate what i need like what I considered to be like good food however I was eating nowhere near enough of that and mm -hmm. um, so I think this year training wise it's been a big strength cycle um, in the off season and I've also managed to sort of like overcome a lot of barriers with my eating I've eat, I'm eating a lot more than I was and it's kind of made me realize how little I was fueling my training mm -hmm. so f eating's gone better and um, training wise I wouldn't say we've done a lot of aerobic and stuff it's very much just been weightlifting with a lot of high skill um sessions afterwards just mix and matching ring muscle ups bar muscle ups making sure that i keep on top of that sort of stuff and obviously the past year i've been pretty much in wigan i'd say 70 percent of the time so got a taste for it last year where 
the guys were training for semis and I was training alongside them just getting obviously like that, that environment was great everyone was buzzing off each other training for semis and I almost got that buzz to put into my off season with my lifting and that was great just to kind of be around it and experience it and then obviously um since September I've been living in Wigan now um hoping to be here for <laughs> you don't move out of Wigan <laughs> what's, what, whatever's needed but like yeah during my athletic career anyway I feel like obviously having the gym there now it's easier to get to I can juggle uni a lot better with it um so yeah training at the start it was a bit wobbly just because when uni kicked in obviously Covid's not as present or yeah. a lot like the restrictions have been lifted so i've been in uni a fair bit more i've been having to travel to liverpool and um, traveling back every so often during the week um i feel like that initially was a little bit of a challenge just because i was getting on top of uni a bit of a mental energy had to go towards that so training never took a back seat but like just trying to find a balance for both of them and yeah. um, i feel like now uni's finishing i'm getting to be a full-time <laughs> what I'd like to say full time athlete again so I can put a bit more of that mental energy into my training so I can make sure that just the little bits of recovery things like sleep are on top of I found with uni if I'd revise too late I'd go to bed and I'd just be thinking about an exam or mm -hmm. the papers and I'd be a bit over, too overstimulated whereas that'll calm down so I can sort of focus on what's needed to get better I just want to pick up on that nutrition bit a little bit more um like, how did you realise that you weren't eating enough? It might sound really simple, but, like, for yourself, did, how did you kind of work that out, like, between, I don't know, you and Steve, or was it yourself? Or? Um, so I remember when I'd first done... So the first time I did SID mm -hmm. in 2019, my diet at that point was shocking. Um, I'd go to the gym, I'd eat a chocolate bar... <laughs> I'd eat some drumstick squashies. I loved it. Um, my eating was not great. I remember I used to take what I thought was good nutrition. I'd take a pack of microwave rice. I'd do my training session and I'd put that in the microwave and chomp on it. Um, that would literally be, that would be it. I had no sort of like decent knowledge of it myself. And then after Sid, I realised, I was like, right, if I want to be an athlete, I've got to eat like an athlete. So that was something I tried to crack down on, but I just think my own sort of lack of knowledge. I knew what food groups I had to be eating I just didn't eat enough and one way that I definitely knew that I was not eating enough was my hormonal balance was quite wishy-washy for a good two years like I'm not ashamed to say it like I did lose my period for two years and um, that was sort of like I didn't realize myself how bad that can be and how important obviously it is for a female to have a natural cycle so I think the realization hit in when a lot of people when I told them they were quite shocked and they were like you definitely need to do something about yeah. that and I think one thing that did help last year was um, I, when I was living with Martha mm -hmm. she very much helped me make sure I was eating enough like she'd ask me what I was eating throughout the day she'd like check check up on me and um, also we dominate nutrition started writing um, macros for me so I was following that and I was definitely eating a lot more I feel like when I first tried to start sort out my diet I was like no sugar, nothing, maybe the odd treat on a Saturday. I was so restrictive, but I look back now and I think, why did I do that to myself? Like, I remember, I, I vividly remember craving like a rich tea biscuit and I was like, I'm not letting myself have it because it's a biscuit. And it got to the point where I was probably in maybe like 1500 calories a day. And I was probably training like four or five hours in the day. And I lost a lot of weight very quickly. And mm -hmm. that sort of, I realize now like, how important food actually is and easily I'll meet in about 3,500 calories a day yeah. with no guilt no like anxiety or anything whereas sort of trying to overcome that I was constantly hooked to my fitness pal yeah. I managed to before the open I was like right I'm taking a step away from that and I'm gonna eat for performance and yeah I think I'm doing a good job of it now I'd like to think yeah. anyway <laughs> and, and I, I would agree and you, you've got to um, like it's a it's a process but just because like someone might say here's a, everything that you might need to do mm -hmm. and it might be like a big jump like these things can't just be done like at the click of the fingers like it's a process that takes time and I feel like you know from knowing you from probably when I first met you to now like it does you know it does take time to get these habits and like the um, 
you know, mentally how you might think about uh, in certain food groups or certain certain things. You can't just overcome that overnight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is a process. Um, and yeah, like you say, you've 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 turned it around o- over the over the course of the years and. Yeah, well, you've no, so yeah. I think that I think that honesty and you know vulnerability that you that you showed there. A lot of people m- will probably be in a similar position, you know, as you, and hopefully that will be a you know a bit of inspiration yeah. for them to try and sort it out as well. Because uh, again, how many people probably don't eat enough, uh, you know, as well as trying to juggle work, like trying to fit in meals and in, in, you know in between, you know trying to get training in as well yeah. like it's quite difficult but and I had this conversation with the athletes on the training camp and most well, quite a few of them were full time coaches and they basically would train and then go straight into coaching and like just not eat or wouldn't eat for like four hours because they had four hours of coaching and PT and, and I said you're putting all this effort into your training yeah. but you're not recovering. You're not going to be recovering, yeah. you know, well enough from that training. So basically, the training that you're doing is pointless. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, more, it's actually more detrimental. Yeah. Yeah. But also, I'm, um, like, yeah, I agree with that. And back, back in the day, back in the day when I was competing, 2012, like early doors of CrossFit, like paleo was the thing, and it's like you had to eat paleo if you're a CrossFit, and that was like <laughs> that means you don't eat bread, you don't eat <laughs> rice. Like you eat little fruit, and it's actually ridiculous how mm. like we were all um, like told that we should need to eat. I remember the first time like I just started eating bread with my scrambled eggs, and I just felt like I just felt like full <laughs> and strong. And my mum started making me some sweet potato soup, and I remember the first time she made me sweet potato soup. She made like a decent batch of it, and she gave me because I lived in Wigan at this time. She she sent me sent me back with it when I went visiting and it obviously lasted like a week I PB'd everything <laughs> because I just suddenly started eating like more carbs and I yeah. was just like mum that's whatever, whatever you put in that sweet potato soup <laughs> I need more of it and it, but it was just like and it took time and it's just like now you, there's a load of nutritionists out there that are more about health and performance and well, well-being back we're talking 10 years ago now it was very much about being like restrictive and restrictive and strict and only you should be eating this only a little bit to that and this and it's it's good that it's developed from back how it was but i still think people are stuck um you know in that old yeah way of thinking of what's what's healthy yeah. and even and even like you know your general day-to-day people who do, don't compete in any form of sport will, will come across that but it's it still leaks into sport and performance yeah um, you know, it's it, there's some great nutritionists out there. Like, yeah, we dominate in nutrition. And the guys at PH Nutrition are, are great as well. They're they're changing, it, especially in CrossFit. But um, I still think it's a it's a mentality that's maybe just been drilled into society from like younger ages and parents, because all they knew about was like dieting yeah. and not eating like say rich, yeah. rich tea biscuits. Um, <laughs> to, to to what it people what we know more about yeah. you know, developed and more about now. I feel like it's like society's view on like how you should look as well. Yeah. I think it doesn't affect me now. I'd say like I'm I'm happy. I, I'm comfortable in my skin. Like my body can do cool stuff, and that's yeah. like that's what I'm training for. Do you know what I mean? Like I I want to go to the CrossFit Games. Like the product of the training or how you look. Like at the end of the day, you're a person. Like how you look shouldn't matter. I think that was something that used to bother me and I think that was one of the reasons why I was quite restrictive I, I remember going to the likes of Nando's and restaurants and the first thing I'd be doing is looking up the macros online seeing if I could put it into my fitness pal and even just doing that was just draining like exhausting I was like why, why am I doing this but my body just wouldn't let me like do any different and I thought oh no if I eat another 200 calories if I have another protein shake like that's more calories I'm, I'm worried I'm gonna gain weight and like that's so I look back and I just think why like what why why did I put myself through that and like why obviously it's like it's hard when you're so, you're consumed by it and you're stuck in it but honestly like when when you realize like what's important it's it's honestly it's just so much better like I don't even think twice about say I'm having a squares bar yeah, like yeah. I have them before every session now it's like my pre-training carb something to get in me and like 
in the past I'd look at that I'd be like oh I can't eat that yeah. like yeah, it's, yeah. it looks like a chocolate bar like a that's for Saturday yeah. whereas <laughs> now I'm like I will sorry in squares bars all that <laughs> get them in. in me like yeah um, I get the other kind of point that I wanted to touch um, kind of more on training this this past year is um, like what stuff do you still feel like you you struggle with in training like what do you still have mental blocks like is there anything else you, you struggle with yeah um, I'd be lying if I said that m- m- on the mental side of things I was like 100% spot on with it because I feel like there's still I still have days where I might doubt a lift, like I'll overthink maybe a clean just because obviously how I used to be back then with like injury, um, I try so hard to sort of like push that aside. I'd be lying if I said it didn't come creeping back sometimes, but I feel like I manage it better now. And for example, the quarterfinals, the clean, like sometimes I get intimidated by heavy weight, but I think when I when your adrenaline kicks in and you know it matters, like I almost forget about it and I'm trying to sort of approach my sessions like that all the time and just think like you've done this multiple times like you, you train every day you, you're stronger like you, you are capable of it I think weightlifting is still that sort of component for me that does need to get better I'm really proud that it didn't sort of cost me like it did last year it's obviously still something that everything needs to get better that in particular but yeah I feel like challenge wise mental, m- mental challenges are probably the main thing at the minute that I'd say on spot on but everything else has definitely improved sort of recovery eating um just like how I do talk to myself sometimes is definitely better um I feel like I've built a lot of resilience over the past two years like especially with like the injury it's sort of taught me a lot yeah there's a, there's two kind of things that are really sticking out to me from you know this conversation that we've had is that like over the years you're starting to control you know more of the things that you can actually control mm-hmm. and taking responsibility for them which is is really good and then for the more for the mental side of things but the the self-talk it sounds like that's getting more positive and because it's getting more positive and you're kind of trying to big yourself up a bit more rather than focusing on the negative like I feel like that's kind of making quite a big difference as well which yeah. is you know just interesting to to hear as well yeah. um is there anything else you want to touch on, Steve? No, I think that was a good, uh, good talk. There's a few things I found out about you that I wasn't, didn't, didn't know about. <laughs> Watch out for you. You were so young. Strength and depth, which is the June. It's June, isn't June it? June 10th, yeah. 11th and 12th. You made your first appearance. So your last time you had competed individually was Filthy 150. Filthy 150. <laughs> Love that competition. Yeah, oh, obviously one of the best weekends of my life. So, yeah. Watch out for your strength and depth. Yeah. So next time people see you. <laughs> I feel like you're going to have to uh, share this video of you doing flips and t- turns and everyone's going to want to see it now. I've got fails as well around <laughs> my head. I'm going to do a little what's that word, Please do post some of these. <laughs> <laughs> now that's awesome. Thank you very much, Ella. Thank Cheers, Steve. Do you. <laughs> hey team, I hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Ella. Um, great to kind of introduce her to people that might not be aware of her or just not know her very well um, she's a great person to be around and hopefully you get to meet her at some of the regional events later on this year or on the uh, competition circuit at some point I just want to share a few other things that we've got coming up but um, we have some weightlifting workshops at high performance CrossFit uh, these are from for anyone from complete beginner up until you know quarterfinals, semi-finals level. And if you need to work and refine your technique on weightlifting or in weightlifting, uh, I would suggest you get booked on these. It's on the fifth of June um, at sixty pound per person. We've got a little break for regionals for the next couple of months but we're going to do some special kind of editions of regionals that are going to be more outdoor based so watch out for those we'll be dropping details for them very soon Um, really excited to get a few other people involved uh, in running those sorts of regional events as well so stay tuned and we'll be back next week